Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hugo Brandis, and I'm the executive director of the Urban Planning Program here at Georgetown. Uh, we are uh, into our fall lecture series <coughs> that is themed around uh, planning big investments in big cities. Uh, there are a couple of themes associated with this that uh, prompted um, the fall lecture series. First and foremost, um, the idea of planning being connected to implementation. Uh, in other words, not planning for policy sake only, but thinking about how do plans lead to investments. <clears throat> and then second, the big theme really is around once those investments have been committed, how does the planning environment change around them? Uh, so increasingly in many cities, we see major investments uh, being implemented over 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Uh, the city that exists when those projects are done is very different than the city that existed when they were originally conceptualized. And how do you handle um, investments in, in dynamic, uh, dynamic settings? Uh, we've heard some, from some wonderful speakers, including uh, um, uh, our, our instructor, uh, Michael Kelly, last week. And I'm very excited uh, today to welcome Jagger Lynch to, to Georgetown. Um, Jay is a very special person uh, here in the city. Uh, he's been active professionally for uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, and really <clears throat> coincided with uh, the rebirth of, of, of local Washington. Um, Jay uh, has a background in, in urban planning and urban design, uh, as well as uh, civil engineering from Stanford University. Um, Jair has been recognized as a Loeb Fellow at Harvard University, a very important uh, award. And um, uh, I'd like to leave you with this idea that uh, Jair has been very engaged in both public sector planning and private sector planning. And so today, uh, what we're going to hear from him um, is some thoughts and reflections on how those two come together and how it impacts associated with projects can be planned at the outset of the projects. Thanks so much for being here, Jacob. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am very excited to be here. I'm sitting at, uh, right in front of one of my favorite people, Michael Kelly, and there are lots of other folks in, in the audience, Barbara, as well. And I've grown very close to, and it's helped my professional career, which has been uh, a great whirlwind. Um, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, I grew up here in Washington, D.C. I always start with that when I'm here locally. It makes a big difference to most people. Um, it makes a big difference in the concept of planning, the concept of creating something indigenous. Um, so I grew up in Upper Northwest, went to school here, uh, went to California, um, and started my real estate career there. But quickly learned about the importance of understanding your customer. I worked at a company called Silicon Graphics, in which I was part of their corporate real estate group. And my job, besides building buildings, was to understand how to make engineers stay for 90 hours a week. They printed <laughs> t-shirts that talked about, I worked 90 hours a week and loved it. Um, and so my job was to create real estate that allowed for that. Um, and as the young person in the group, I had to do most of the research as well as the finance and the, the normal blocking and tackling of building buildings. And that research in the early 90s taught me that the young people of the day, the engineers that were going to shape the internet, were going to reject um, the suburban, first generation American dream that was, going, that was put forth after World War II. It sounds very old hat now, because <laughs> everyone has accepted that there's a second American dream. But at that moment in time, it was very cutting edge. Um, and I really appreciated that education, because I, I started to understand that you could create great places for these people that were going to be coming through the pipeline over the next 20 years. I came back to Washington, and like every story, you have to have a, a downfall and then a rise. I came back to Washington, pitched this idea to all the developers here, and they laughed in my face. And they said, you need to go out and work in, on 66 and do research and development buildings, because that's really what you, you worked at a computer company which built research and development buildings, and that's all you should do. I said, that's really not where my passion is. That's really not where the market's going to go. I have to come up with a way to uh, 
uh, deal with all this information that I had in my head, as well as this passion that I had in my heart. Because when I left Washington, D.C., it was 1989. Uh, it was the murder capital of the, of the world on a per capita basis. Um, I um, spent time at 14th and U um, when it was still riot torn. Um, I spent time on Wheeler Avenue in the Southeast. I spent time on George Avenue in Pepper. I spent time in each one of these neighborhoods that have changed dramatically over the last 20 years. But when I came back in the late 90s, nothing had changed. Um, I had learned all these things about what it takes to change cities, but nothing had changed, and, and it was right. I came back and started the company in 1998. There were several things that happened at that moment. Um, there was a new mayor. Uh, there was a control board, uh, there was a charter school movement, um, there was uh, metro stations on the Green Line that were about to open. All of these things were happening when I, was, when I arrived back and, and decided to start my own company and made a conscious decision of moving beyond just thinking of ourselves as a developer to think of ourselves as an urban regeneration company, which is uh, what we call ourselves. We believe that we think about places holistically and we have one very, very simple mission, which is create great places. And we create great places for a variety of people, um, from a customer that wants to enjoy retail, from a senior that wants to enjoy the, the, the end of their, their, their active life, to children in schools, to people in libraries, to all of these great places. We see ourselves as very much at the nexus of creating these great places and making sure that that empowers people in so many ways that are beyond uh, just the buildings and the bricks and sticks. So we've done a lot in the last 15 plus years. Um, we've developed over 3 million square feet of neighborhood assets. Um, we work mostly in neighborhoods. That's where we feel like we're most needed. That's where the change is happening. That's where the change has to happen in a responsible way. Um, and we think we've created some dynamic projects and Thank goodness we've been able to hire some great architects to do that because we're not architects. Um, we don't even pick up a pencil or a pen and just make sure that they think about all the things that we think about, which is how do people walk into buildings? How will they experience it? How will it be a beacon of hope uh, in places like um, uh, Ward 7, this is Hillcrest, uh, stable um, middle class neighborhood, but uh, surrounded by very troubled spots in terms of young people and so this becomes a beacon for them, as you can see, at day and at night. I hope to walk you through our investment pieces, be a little wonky, and then tell you some stories that are kind of funny. Um, and I'll, I'll, we'll do one right after I go through how we think of the world. We call this our urban regeneration pyramid. We think of the world as having five stages. Um, we think that you start at neglect and you can move all the way to stage five. We think there are very, very specific things that happen throughout there, throughout these stages. And we think there's very specific policy things that have to happen to make sure that at the end of being in a stage five place, that we've actually reinvented what that is. For a long time, that was uh, the end of, of the American dream, which was a suburban household with a white picket fence. We think it's dynamic urban places full of diversity. We think that's what stage five is, and we have to put uh, your thinking cap on how long will it take, what are the tools that need to be put in place, and what are the investments that need to be made from a planning perspective as well as a public infrastructure perspective. What does that look like? Uh, these are some stats. Um, it's very, very stark in some cases. A stage one place, um, this could be considered Deanwood or Congress Heights. Um, people uh, don't take offense by some of these stats. These are stats. This is not an indication of where they could be, but this is an indication of what's there. I think we have to be realistic about that. Submarket median income, 36,000, while in a stage five place, you're out of 120. Um, the ones that, that really think that, we have hundreds of these stats for all of these, all of these uh, stages, but a couple of them pop out. What people spend away from home, $20 a week versus 68. $30 a week at groceries versus 91. Um, you can see why grocery stores wait until they get to about here before they make investments. Um, you can see that a lot of folks are looking for, for uh, crime stats to start to drop. And you can see what's interesting is that 
violent crime drops when you go down, down up the scale, but nonviolent crime goes up because people are snatching cell phones and other things. And so there are different things that happen uh, as you go up the scale. And you have to understand that not every single place will be a stage five place. But if you can move from stage one to stage two to stage three, stage three is perfectly fine. And it works. It's a working class place where median income is about, about 60. And we think that, that a combination of public investments as well as private investments can actually make um, these places great. What we find as we shortcut in our discussions about stages is that sometimes you try to make a stage three place in a stage two place, or bring a stage three building to a stage two place, it may be too much too fast. And the perfect example of that is, while this is a great library in Ward 7, six years earlier, we tried to take uh, the downtown Ward 7 library and rehabilitate that and add artist housing above. And David uh, Ajay was the architect on this building. And our first attempt east of the river for a library uh, did not go as well. Uh, we rolled out a mixed use building at a metro station, artist lived work housing above, seemed as though it was a win win from a lot of perspectives, uh, and we got such a blowback. Um, and this is uh, theoretically the hometown kid who can come in and sell rain, and I mean sell gold to anyone. Uh, but we got such blowback, and I'll never forget the statement that came out of those meetings. Um, I guess Oprah had a show earlier that week that talked about pedophiles. We had our meeting that weekend, and people thought that the, that the artist that lived upstairs in the attic would walk downstairs and molest the children and that we needed to get the hell out of the neighborhood. Why would you think of bringing these artists to our neighborhood that would live upstairs in the attic? Because the concept of mixed use hadn't even really floated through the minds of folks that lived in downtown Ward 7 because downtown Ward 7 is actually a first generation suburb. And most of downtown Ward 7 is one or two stories. So the concept of mixed use, the concept of artist housing, concept of pulling these things together to create vibrancy was, we were laughed out of the room. Um, and it was a hard lesson um, to understand that sometimes you will try to introduce ideas at the wrong time. Um, many years later, we're able to build something great in that neighborhood, not mixed use, for another reason. It was on National Park Service land, and they, they didn't want to have anything to do with housing. Um, but it, it makes a difference. But as you can see, over the years, we've worked in almost every single ward of the city. Um, and we're very, we very much understand every single block. That, that's what differentiates us. We understand every single block in the city. We understand the politics. We understand the investment. We understand both pro public and private. We understand the trends. We understand the impacts of what the metro or bus lines have done. Uh, and we try to make uh, wise investment decisions with our own capital or make recommendations to our clients to make wise investment decisions going forward. And I'll share one story uh, with you about that. Uh, we've worked on mixed use projects like the Thurgood Marshall Center, uh, we did with Shalom, uh, back in the late 90s. Um, this is a American treasure, old one, oh, first African American YMCA. Um, was protected by our trust and worked uh, as a consultant uh, of rehabilitating this into a mixed use building, theoretically. It had a school on the first floor, on the ground floor, a conference center on the first floor, and then offices on the upper floors. Um, and we were very proud because it's one of those buildings that actually started to reweave the fabric of the neighborhood. It became an anchor very early before the metro opened in Shaw couple of blocks off of U Street. This was one of the one of the buildings that at that moment stood very tall amongst all the other row houses that were in the area. Only the Masonic Temple um, uh, competed with it. Now it's dwarfed by many of the buildings on 14th Street. But for a long time it stood as a beacon for the neighborhood and getting that done very early in the process of the growth of, of uh, the Shaw area was very important. This was probably a stage two neighborhood at the time. 
we hope that this and many other projects around it helped it move to stage three and then, the, and then it started taking off on its own. Another project in that 14th Street corner, old riot tour neighborhood, uh, a set of condominiums in which we tried to introduce mixed income housing uh, that hit all levels, 30% AMI, 50% AMI, 80% AMI. Very important, uh, very early in the growth of the U Street corridor. Uh, we were very proud of finishing that project through the downturn. Um, but the stories that come out of these lessons was also being bold in terms of some of the decisions. We, we looked at small businesses that were getting priced out of the neighborhood. So we actually got a special zoning uh, categorization to really wedge in an idea that, again, now is normal, but then was not, which is a concept of live work, to try to encourage small businesses to stay in the area through an ownership model and not get priced out as we knew the neighborhood was going to change dramatically over time. Because it was a public-private partnership, that planning, that connection to the overall uh, vision of the city, we were able to adjust the purchase price of the land to allow for this special use. In a normal private transaction, you probably wouldn't be able to do that because actually we, have, we took a discount on the land but ensured that we provide these little work opportunities for folks. We think it made a difference in what, how this neighborhood continues to be vibrant and doesn't just rapidly change to the point where there's no diversification. There are people here that will continue to own work in the same room. That's very important. Another project down the street was the Bread for the City. Uh, this is a nonprofit that provides both primary care facilities, primary care services, as well as legal and other services. We made sure that we connected with the um, uh, primary care association, help them think through where are the health disparities that are happening all over the city. Uh, and they quickly figured out that nationally it was happening in Ward 7, nationally it was happening in Ward 8, but it was also happening in Ward 4, it was also happening in Shaw. We actually went through an investment strategy with them of finding locations that would actually allow them to address these health gaps. So it wasn't, it wasn't really about the buildings, it was about filling gaps in where there was service around the city. And these primary care facilities become the backstop after we closed DC General 10 plus years ago. Um, and really not having a place for people to go and get their primary, primary care services uh, taken. Uh, another one of these primary care facilities is at the bottom of a mixed-use building that we did, um, introducing commercial and daytime population to uh, the Petworth neighborhood, again, very early in its maturation, uh, with 130 affordable units above. Uh, very proud of this project, we won all kinds of architectural awards, but more importantly, at the time, when we competed against other developers to win this site, the natural push was condominiums and market rate housing, we say, this is really your last chance at Petworth to actually inject some public policy goals that could last for 20, 30 years. And so the selection of our, of our team was really as a function of, this is the way we are able to achieve a programmatic goal um, at a location that, again, after a master plan that was done in 2000, 2002, with a built, up, a built program that was going to be done over 15 years, this was a way about five years into that program to actually make sure there was an anchor. So it's okay when the Safeway across the street goes to market rate housing, because guess what? There's 130 affordable homes here. It's okay when other pieces of the, of the, of the fabric get filled in at private, at private sector transactions that happen at a, at a market rate, because there's something here that's already an anchor. It was a build first strategy without ever calling it a build first strategy here with this, with this, with this uh, community. We've done the same in uh, stage four places, U Street, just a couple years ago. Uh, we believe had reached the stage four uh, level uh, and is rapidly moving through stage four. Uh, we uh, were contacted because of our work by a neighborhood um, association as well as the tenant association of the Dunbar Apartments, um, we were able to solve this puzzle um, of protecting 170 seniors at this location in the middle of the recession. Um, and when DHC was not flush with cash as it is now. Um, so this project uh, has no um, soft second funding. 
Um, it simply got there by actually reaching back to the federal government with a long-term HAP contract and some very good financial structuring that, that our team did. But this, again, for the next 40 years, as rapidly as U Street's going to change, there will be 107 seniors that will be able to enjoy all of the fruits of what's happened on U Street. They may not go to every restaurant, but they can go to a doctor. They may not go to, uh, to a club, but they may go to the grocery store. Uh, they will be able to enjoy all the pieces, or most of the pieces that are happening in this location. And we're able to do that by, frankly, cross-subsidizing what is going to be a new tower that's going to be on the parking lot. Um, this is going to be a condominium project that's in the ground now. We're able to cross-subsidize the affordable by doing this market rate building. Um, we think this is the way in which you're going to have to solve uh, deep affordability for people making 20, 30, 40% of AMI. Um, and we think that this becomes a model for the future uh, where you're respecting the, the, the past and then building for the future at the same time. On H Street, um, a plan was well conceived back in 2004 by the district. <laughs> of making significant investments into the corridor. Uh, the biggest, of course, was the streetcar investment, but there were also a lot of other zoning and other planning components. And as, as it was said, I do come from an urban design background and very much appreciated um, the, the thoughtfulness of how H Street could develop over time, could develop as an entertainment district, could develop as a central hub for housing could develop for a shopping district. And we very much watched it. Um, we did development services and projects for our clients in the neighborhood in the early 2000s, and then jumped in deep in 2011. We bought the entire block, the entire 600 block of Main Street, the southern side. Um, and at that point, it was a government building that sometimes shows the inconsistencies between agencies where a plan had been laid out to encourage uh, retail development but the government was leasing space at the first floor uh, of, of an entire block of 500 feet of what could be potentially retail. Um, so we purchased the, the site uh, with our investors and convinced the government to align their leasing practices with their planning practices and said, you have to get out from, on, from the first floor. You have to allow us to create 30,000 square feet of retail that can really invigorate the street. You have to allow us to demolish one of the buildings and shrink your space. They actually love that because it's going to save them money. Um, they were at 98% of the space, 190,000 square feet. At the end of the day, you're going to be about 85,000 square feet, all in the upper floors of one of the buildings. That allows us to de demolish one of the buildings and build a new 300-unit uh, apartment building that, that allows us to connect retail all the way across the block. Now it'll be about 30,000 square feet of retail. Funny story about H Street to me is that while most corridors have resulted uh, in growth, uh, commercial corridors, because both sides of the street um, essentially filled in, um, to me, Capitol Hill was just begging to deal with their back door um, because there was a lot of disposable income, there was a lot of things that were happening in Capitol Hill for many years, but the back door, H Street, essentially was uh, persona on the rod. No one wanted to spend time there. And the institutions that were, that were above that in um, Gat and Get were also very enclosed at the time. But as soon as the plan really um, enlivened the attitude, frankly, to start the attitude of A Street, it really started to spark investments. And quickly, the rest of the course said, it's great. We can get a lot of millennials to come here um, late at night. But we actually can open during the day and in the evening because a lot of Capitol Hill folks will actually turn their uh, no longer turn their back to the to the Street corridor and actually uh, come up and, and enjoy the retail um, diversity that can happen. We think that H Street is one of those one of the last uh, authentic places in Washington D.C. I think the challenge over the next 20 years is that we're going to be developing places that are um, essentially blank slates. And are we going to do that with authenticity? Are we going to do that by creating great places? Or are they going to be cookie cookie cutter places? that are um, a result of just big box, kind of big institutional thinking versus the uh, granular growth, organic growth that can happen in those commercial quarters, like 14th Street and like B Street. So when you think of Papa Point, and when you think of, um, um, when you think of Walter Reed, 
Uh, but for the historic buildings, these are massive swaths of land that can be planned in a way that, that we may lose a lot of the soul of the place. And we think that this is a great example of where the soul of the place is going to intersect with capital, uh, new blood, and uh, a deep commitment toward affordability that's already happening on the block. On, on the we hope that that happens in some of the other locations. And this is a shot from the interior courtyard. As we start thinking about how sustainability is very important to us uh, with low impact design at all levels, um, and also just thinking about how you can be whimsical. Uh, for us, creating great places is about being whimsical at times. And so just taking uh, one of the walls of the building and allowing it to, to play movies is going to be a great uh, feature for the residents, and we hope that that will encourage uh, collaboration with the entire neighborhood in which people can enjoy this, this interior courtyard and, and this movie space. And now we're, uh, I'll quickly go to Half Street. This is our latest um, acquisition. This is right across the street from the um, uh, baseball stadium. Um, these are the 2007 designs that were done by Shimon Karanis. Um, we acquired the east side of the block as you walk into the stadium. Um, but one of the things I've said publicly is that in 2007, there was this desire to pull people down to this area because there was nothing. The stadium wasn't even built yet. Um, fast forward six or seven years, it's a neighborhood first that just happens to have a stadium, which means that you can think about this, um, uh, this street in a completely different way as it relates to retail. This is going to be neighborhood service retail versus festival retail that was going to be, unfortunately, I think, um, very much a generic, um, a generic offering that really catered to people from Virginia that came into the baseball stadium eight times, eight times a year. Now, we're going to introduce a, set of, uh, a level of authenticity that existing neighbors will keep alive, um, but the, 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 the guests from Virginia and Maryland that come into the games will enjoy something different and not just um, your standard fare that you might find in the suburbs. Um, so we think this is going to be a really dynamic, uh, retail-rich, project in which we can really get our hands dirty in terms of creating place for the neighbors um, of this burgeoning capital growth front um, neighborhood, and we think it'll be very exciting. And then I'm going to close with two projects that had heavy public engagement, um, because as we talk about some of these others, they had, you know, level six and seven uh, uh, levels of engagement. Now we're going to talk about things that are taking level 10 and above in terms of uh, engagement. The McMillan Reservoir is a uh, piece of property that the district purchased from the federal government in 1987 with a specific mandate, which is why they purchased it for $8 million, to develop it. Um, it is not part of the 60 plus acres that the federal government still re uh, retains through the Army Corps of Engineers. It is not part of the original park that was uh, west of First Street. This is the 25 acres between First Street and North Capitol, which if you drive up North Capitol, you have these views of what something looks like Star Wars with silos coming out of it. <laughs> um, and this project um, very much will test the wits of any uh, developer or architect um, because it is so complex, but yet it needs to be so, it needs to be, the opportunity is so simple. It's an opportunity to create an industrial site into a place where people can, can engage. This was a water filtration site which a fence and or a landscape burn kept people out of. Uh, couldn't inhabit the underground, unlike the DuPont underground. It was really, the only thing that was supposed to be underground was water. Um, there are thousands of manholes on top of it so you can't play baseball or soccer. But we're going to actually create it in a way that people can enjoy it, can get to it, and really fill the donut hole that's happened of all the institutions that have been built around it, Howard and Catholic and the Bloomingdale and, and Stronghold neighborhoods that have been short over time, and this has left uh, desolate. And I believe it's created a romanticism around the collect, which I think is a very, very difficult thing for us as Washingtonians to digest. There are parts of our city that we just accept for having a chain of events. 
It was set for just being empty. And our minds start to move towards, well, let's just keep it that way. And it goes back to the stories I had when I told you I was in Ward 7 trying to introduce this concept of artists live work housing on top of a brand new library. Some of those responses after the Oprah comments went out the window, it was, don't do anything to it. Just make the air conditioning work. And I will be, I will be satisfied with that. And it really showed me that how people have been stymied by the lack of progress on several things that have happened in the city. And the Office of Planning and many other agencies have worked hard, don't get me wrong, but there's still pockets of neglect and happened that have warped our sense of reality and have really stymied our ability to imagine what could be and how we really could engage in a great place like Milton. So the development team is ourselves, Trauma Pro and EYA. Uh, our responsibility here is to act as a lead developer on the multifamily, consistent with the rest of our practice, as well as assist with the public amenities and the public spaces that are going to be very critical here in activating these silos and making them beacons instead of something mysterious that you only want to look at from the tapestry. So through that, we are not only um, developing the multifamily on the market rate side, but also developing the, the senior affordable component and driving that affordability down further than uh, regulations as part of zoning. Uh, we're doing that because, again, we think that in 10, 15 years, like the other neighborhoods that we've worked in, the, the changes that will happen here will start to price people out and driving that affordability in early in the upstream is very important, which is why we're doing that with a 20% affordability um, pledge throughout the project. Uh, with a senior component, very much can heard from the community that there's a lot of seniors, especially African-American families that are older. They don't want to leave the area. They see the amenity in the hospital being nearby. And how do we find a place for them to age in place in the neighborhood? And this is one of the ways that we can do that. So through that, we've had 200 plus meetings over a seven year period. Um, we're, we're heading into our third mayor soon, um, which is usually considered a death nail in a big public private project. But there, there's been tremendous um, momentum, especially in the last two years, with the addition of Ann Corbett as our project director. Um, she has really uh, harnessed what was thousands and thousands of pieces of paper of sketches and ideas that came from architects, that came from community members, that came from park activists, that came from affordable housing activists, and she coalesced all that information and then re, um, resituated the entire team and allowed us to really step our game up. Uh, before, there was an attempt to uh, look outward for architectural clues. Um, now, the team is looking inward with a set of design guidelines. It's going to make McMillan unique. There's been a, a tremendous um, historic preservation uh, gestures that will uh, make this place really stand out. Not only the above grade resources, of which 90% of those above grade resources, historic resources, Retain, but a commitment to, to try to maintain some of the below grade resources and um, uh, a significant uh, uh, component of them. Where there's 25 acres, I think there's two each, each uh, about 20 cells. There's a, an attempt to hold on to probably two cells and incorporate some of the buildings into the cell architecture. So the community center, for instance, will have a pool that will uh, recall something uh, akin to a Turkish bath. Um, very different than its use, but at least have some gesture towards water in the underground spaces when there was never a place for, for human uh, uh, interaction in these spaces before. So really telling the new story of how this can be a great place in the future. And all of that has really allowed, uh, tested my patience, tested my intellect, uh, tested our pocketbook, um, but it's a better project for it. Um, and if there's going to be a legacy project in, in our portfolio, uh, I want this to be that, um, because we really can create a very special place that would be very different than most everything in Washington, D.C. There are no streets now. There's no sewers. There's nothing there. And so we're going to be starting from scratch. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, as we go for the next 20 years and we talk about creating new places from scratch, there's no grid, there's nothing. 
Um, this is going to be a real test of whether or not we can get it right. And then finally, I will talk about one of our uh, uh, newest assignments, um, which is the uh, redevelopment of the Martin Luther King Library, which is just a few blocks away from here. Um, we are uh, acting as a consultant for uh, the library, um, walking them through what will be a uh, very arduous uh, entitlement process, um, but really uh, uh, recognizing that there will be a gem at the end of the day when there's a new central library, when I say new, rehabilitated central library, um, that brings all of the things that a 21st century library has to have um, into a building that really has been neglected, again, for 40 years. It was built um, at the end of Mies van der Rohe's career in 1968, finished in 71-2. Uh, he was not alive for the opening, um, and really has not been much upkeep of the building since. So I'm going to go back to that same theme um, of 10 years prior uh, in downtown Ward 7. I heard plenty of people come up to me and say, don't do anything to it. Just turn the lights back on. Um, when, when this opened, uh, there was no metro downtown. Now there's a metro across the street. If you remember, uh, when this opened, there was a concrete plaza because G Street wasn't open for vehicular traffic. Um, there was no Verizon Center. There was no one living downtown. Um, and so Ms. Vanderbilt would be the first person to say that universal design allows you to adapt to what are, what are the needs of, of the time and the place. And I've actually started to think about that more and more about universal design as we think about the places, the projects and the places we work, because you need to be flexible. Because what is a stage three place today may be a stage five place 20 years from now. And will the buildings, will the spaces, will the way it interacts with the street, will the entrance sequencing, will all of those things work 20 years from now? And so we're trying to make sure that all of our architecture, all of our urban design planning really thinks about those components. Because after that, as Nisa said, you can change the interior walls how you need them. You can change it from one time an auditorium, the next time a cafeteria, or a time after that a maker box space, all of which we're considering for this building, and all of within the context of what we stand in our building can be. But in the midst of all of that, you can think, you can dream about how you can open up spaces and how you can reinvent how people interact with the building. One of the thoughts and one of the gestures is if everyone has, if everyone has been in this building, there is a beautiful Martin Luther King mural that sits in the lobby. But it's it's a lobby that is so confusing that this is the only thing that anchors you. So if everything else changes, you can still be anchored by the Martin Luther King mural. And maybe you can see light to the, to the street behind you. Maybe you can have uh, signage and, and vertical circulation that helps you understand that there's a library upstairs. And there are things that people can discover, and there are places that people can feel safe. Um, and we hope that that happens um, in the midst of a regulatory process that you could probably um, go shoot yourself over. <laughs> um, we met with uh, NCPC, National Capital Planning Commission, uh, CFA, Commission of Fine Arts, HBRB, um, uh, the zoning adjustment, and possibly the tax credit folks. And they told us this was the first time anyone tried to map all of the agency sign-offs that are needed to get a project like this built. So we prepared ourselves for a marathon. And we wrote a mission statement that made sure that when we we're going through this gymnastics, um, that we don't lose sight around the fact that we have to make this inviting for the people of Washington, D.C. Right now, the loja, the entrance sequence, the vertical circulation, those things don't work. And so we will be working very hard to make sure that after we get through all these processes, that those the tenants of a great place will still be there um, and still satisfying the, the, the desires of the sort of preservation or 
Commission of Fine Arts, the community, and others to make flexible space for the next 50 years. Because we're talking about 3D printing. I don't know how many people have been in the digital commons in, in, the, um, in, the, in the library now, which is a little test case of what it could be as a 3D printer. And I think five, 10 years from now, I bet half the people in this room have a 3, 3D printer in their house. So what is it going to be 20 years from now? And will this space be flexible enough that we can handle it? Um, and we're hoping that we're going to be able to be imaginative, be innovative, in the midst of being in Washington, D.C., which means being part of the regulatory process, and being part of a, a, a heavily planned and a heavy engagement process, which we think can bring the best once we let go of our initial thoughts that just take the fence down and let me go back in to let's think about D.C., let's think about Washington, D.C., 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, and how can we be part, as a community, be part of really creating great places over time that, that people will, will love. That's it. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask you a question about patience in government process, mm -hmm. and you covered that in your last two slides. So that's, that's fantastic. Ooh. I was wondering when you were going to get to that part mm -hmm. or not. Uh, questions? I'd, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Interesting that you used the, 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 the phrase gymnastics when talking about going through that <laughs> process. Um, how, how tricky, how wide an imagination do you have to have as a developer to try to anticipate within the next 20 or 30 years the types of things that Mies van der Rohe and his contemporaries in government in D.C. 40 years ago never really envisioned. A metro, a metro center uh, uh, station, um, people living downtown li or, or living uh, in the gallery place area in much larger numbers, a Verizon center. How broad an, an imagination and anticipation do you really have to have as a developer to try to, to look into the future? and try to logically figure out how this stuff works. Well, I think it's, it's, it starts with making sure that you are connecting. And that's why, I, and that comes from my heart in terms of um, being an urban planner, urban designer at heart. I've always wanted to see what are the long-term plans for a place, whether they're on paper or I have to think through them myself, and say, what is going to happen here? Um, and then the reality is you're not going to solve them all. I'm sure if I sat at the knee of Mies van der Rohe in 1968, he would have, and his MEP would have, and his mechanical engineer would have convinced you that no one wanted outdoor, outdoor air in your building. Because we had mastered, at that moment, mastered air conditioning at a level that the world had never seen, and therefore our buildings need to be airtight and no mechanical windows. Fair. So in those cases, we probably would have been romanticized by that idea and may have gone in. But the concept of not being able to come up with designs or alternatives that you can put on the shelf, that you would say, well, if we do need to open these windows, how would we do it? And will this design only work for a fixed window system? Another example that I've shared with a couple of folks, I am scared out of my wits about parking and building parking for the next 20 years. Yes, you should. Because <laughs> I went to Shanghai in, 20, in 2010 and every major car uh, manufacturer and some of the technology companies, I sat down in the room and they said, we are going to put driverless cars on the road. And we think the grand bargain will be that people will want to, would rather be on their phones or their devices or connected to the internet than actually feel a steering wheel. I think they're right. <laughs> it may not happen today, but I think they're right. And it may not be everybody, but Uber right now is using drivers. Uber may not use drivers 10 years from now. And, and I think that may change the way we park, the way we think about parking with people have cars. And the stats are already creeping in that direction, where we have an increase in population in Washington, D.C. We have a decrease in the amount of automobile registrations. And we're still parking three per thousand, four per thousand. 
what are we going to do with those spaces 20 years from now? If two levels of a parking garage are essentially mothball. Well, we're at least going to put an elevator and a stair that allows you to get to the street. So we're going to do that now. It may not be enough, but at least it's a start. Because that elevator will at least let someone to be able to get down there that may not live upstairs or work upstairs. So there are just a few things that we try to do to try to make sure there's built-in flexibility. We're not going to solve it all. But at least stopping, as we say, planning, and just that mental checklist, that mental discipline, will allow us not to just run to what's, what's new, what's hot, what's, what's in at the moment, but actually think about fundamentals and how to do it. And one last follow-up question on that. During that period, how closely were designers actually looking at possible projections for population, recreation, those types of things? Uh, when? Now? I think during the period when the library was first built, oh. for example. Oh, I don't know. I don't know how strong the planning department was in Washington, D.C. I think at that point, the Commission of Fine Arts and the rest was really no control. There was no planning department yet. There was no local government yet. I mean, this yeah. was done before there was, a, there was a mayor and a local government. Sure, in the back. Johnny, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, very, a lot of great information. But my question to you, and you may have addressed it, but I, I may have missed it. How do you determine, uh, with your urban regeneration pyramid, how do you determine what stage of um, the neighborhoods where they are when you begin the planning process? For years I did it on gut, and then I said, wait a minute, you shouldn't do it on gut. There's enough data out there now that you can figure it out. And it's as simple as um, getting the, the submarket median income to the spending that's happening in that area, to the walk store, to then looking at the plans and saying what, what infrastructure or other investments are going to be happening in that place over the next 10 years. And if they happen, what could it be? The concepts of the streetcar on A Street, those discussions started in 2002, 2004. Now, it did show up for 10 years. You may not make a one to three year investment there, but you're definitely going to be watching to figure out when you and, and or your investors can make uh, a prudent investments at, that, at the appropriate time. Thank you, excellent presentation. Um, the 600 block of H Street, uh, I hate to call them this, but the bookend buildings around the new building that you're putting up now, how do you envision those evolving over the next 10, 20 years? So, so the district government is moving into this, the um, east building uh, at 6th and 7th and H. Um, for us, it was important. Um, that agency is not a auditor or a tech agency. That's the Department of Human Services. So folks are still going to get their tenant checks there. Um, and we try to, because that's what's going on there now. Um, but we try to do it in a humane way, in a respectful way. There's now a uh, 21st century uh, queuing area, similar to what you see at DCRA, so that people can come in and not just stand there lost and feel like they're walking through 17 different security uh, monitors and the entrance sequencing becomes terrible and people spill out on the street. We created a, a grand vestibule and a stair that gets you up to the second floor. And, um, so adding those touches, we think, is going to make that department function better there. Um, and allow for those the customers that, that need to have checks to be part of the revitalization of Main Street. Uh, they may not go out and buy a $1,500 bike when they get their tenant check, but they're not excluded or banished to a different place. Um, the second building at 6th and, and H, uh, we think it's going to be uh, a very dynamic place for the non-traditional office users that are frankly tired of, of the Class B buildings in, in downtown Washington, D.C. and actually want a vibrant place that's possibly closer to home and across the street from Whole Foods. You know, we always choke. Uh, our friends at Insight bought the, the about half a block across the street. I have never seen in anything anywhere I've worked where you go from Murray's on one day to a whole thing to <laughs> on the next day. Usually, there's two or three steps in between, I and mean, that's I mean theoretically that's moving a, moving a place from stage two or three to stage four in one move. Uh, 
So I'm very excited that that book is coming. Thank you. Uh, the streetcar on H Street uh, has been written up as having certain issues with the buses and the parking. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you see H Street sidewalks shrinking? Do you see the streetcars moving over to create car lanes? What, what's going to happen there? And, and Jair, could you, I'm just going to expand that question. Could you reflect, and you just mentioned this before, just reflect a little bit more on the impact of just having the streetcar and, and, and what that's done to conversations that we've been here. Um, First, the master plan, including the public infrastructure components, has set the sidewalks, the parking lanes, the streetcar lane, as well as the vehicular lanes. And that's all in place. I think we're going to have some growing pains in terms of people uh, figuring out how to drive with a streetcar. Uh, I understand they're already giving out parking tickets because people are still double parking. That's not going to happen six months, nine months from now. And, that, and in places like San Francisco, there is mixed, what they call mixed uh, train and vehicular traffic, and people just get used to it. Uh, I think we are going to have some of that um, over time. I would be uh, very much against um, uh, uh, shrinking sidewalks. I'd go the other direction. Um, a good friend of mine, John Peterson, runs a, uh, a nonprofit called Public Architecture. He was on the forefront of this very simple gesture of taking what we call a parklet, which was essentially two parking spaces, and creating an urban design gesture that, that expands up the sidewalk. And it was very whimsical. In certain places, they had um, uh, gym equipment. In other places, uh, uh, it became an expansion of a restaurant uh, to give them more, more spaces. But it's, it's become all kind of, there was one with putt-putt on it. I mean, just very, uh, a way to create public spaces, a very small amount of of square footage um, and only two parking spaces, which can really enliven certain components. So I'm hoping that they'll actually um, look to remove, in, in certain places, a couple parking spaces to actually uh, expand some of the some of the tight sidewalks that are there. And to then to reflect on your the larger point, I think streetcar. The most important thing about any public investment is certainty. And with certainty, there will be a reaction from the private markets. Um, and we're not all the way there yet with the larger system, but I think once we get to certainty, um, which I think is more appropriate in a couple of years, there's some more planning that needs to be done, and there is enough money to do that. I think people try to grab certainty in 2014, and it wasn't really necessary. Um, I think. There is enough money in the capital budget to do the planning and to have the three. They have just announced the three bidders to go through there. In 2016, there needs to be certainty about the streetcar. When you see that, you will see Washington become competitive again against some of the surrounding jurisdictions. Because right now, we are not poised um, with our complicated regulatory process to really um, stand the onslaught of new metro stations in Virginia and the, the uh, lots of attention that's happening around the metro stations in Prince George's County. So I think it's, it's part of our, our competitive um, positioning to get streetcar to a place where it can be certain and that development can happen in much more logical and rational ways inside the city. Regarding the MLK library, was there ever, or has there ever been proposed an idea that they would completely raise these Van der Rohe's building and then put something new there, or has it always been a given that whatever is there stays, but it would be recreated um, it is all, it as, is, as you showed it? Right. So it was nominated in 2008 as a national historic landmark, um, and as such, um, it would be a pretty tough sell. <laughs> Even though I'm made by our standards. <laughs> the, the reason I ask is there's so many rumors, of course, that fly around the city. I'm fairly new back to the city and every single person that I've ever talked to that that is not in the know and they think they're in the know, they've all, including the other day I just got my first library card from that library because right. I was doing some, reach, uh, some research in the Washingtoniana oh, really? part and I asked the woman, um, the attendant at the circulation desk, 
about the building. And she says, oh, well, I didn't go to the last meeting, but I've been to many before. She says, yes, they're knocking the whole thing down and rebuilding it. And I knew that this was not the case. So you just thank you for confirming that. Yeah, I hope their website can confirm that too. <laughs> well, she did, and that was her final statement. She said, but since I'm not sure, maybe you should go on the website and maybe you can get more information there. Right. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. I really enjoyed um, what you shared with us. I was struck by, as someone not from D.C. and from Chicago, I was struck by um, the value you placed on you know, coming back to D.C., having that local, um, that, that local tie. Um, but it seems like what you've been able to do with your firm has been like, some, some really healthy and kind of unique growth, a growth model for the city. Have you thought about expanding to other cities? Because there are plenty of new things that's kind of development. Uh, great question. The follow-up is that you explored cloning yourself because we have more than one job here in Washington. Um, well, there's, uh, I'll try and answer both. Um, at one point, we did think about uh, expanding, um, but we realized that there's a lot of value of knowing every single block. There's a lot of value of knowing of building a primary care facility or um, the seniors in Congress Heights, and then coming back two years later and wanting to develop a school, and coming back five years later and wanting to develop cities. Um, there's a lot of value that you can't get. Um, and because we do the, what's called the messy projects, the difficult ones, that you, couldn't, you can't show up in Chicago and think that you can overcome all of that history. Um, if you were going to Chicago to buy a commodity product, so if we were going to go buy, I don't know, hotels, then yes, but that's not really a business model. And the second part is, can we be cloned? And, and yeah, I, 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 I remember that as a joke, but now I'm going to be serious about this. Well, I think what, that, that... Why are there not more organizations with your business model? So, there's two things. I do think that D.C. is not an entrepreneurial town. Um, it is typically large institutions and very small, I'll call them micro-businesses, less than five people, um, small consulting firms, people exiting the government, what they call it, the revolving door of government. Um, uh, and so it doesn't really celebrate the entrepreneur. Um, and so personally, what was gratifying about doing the Low Fellowship was going and, and learning about entrepreneurs at a national level and figuring out how to connect with that because it really doesn't happen here. Same thing with capital. Um, we had to go to California, um, the California State Teachers Retirement System. Um, the retirement system in California and New York, to Albany, to the New York Common System to become two of our biggest investors. DC has a retirement system. It's not investing. Um, kind of going off the micro business kind of thing. So, micro financing of real estate, like fundraise, what do you think is the future of that? Is that kind of the niche thing right now? Is it going to be the future? And then, kind of a second question that's not related. Um, a lot of the housing that we're seeing around uh, being built here, multifamily, um, is it really appropriate for housing families? I mean, we see them having like singles. Doubles, maybe even micro apartments. Yeah. And just explain what the micro. What yes. Is. So I'll try to answer both. So one, Ben Miller is a good friend, and consider him one of the few other, another of the small group of entrepreneurs here in Washington D.C. I do think fundraising is real. I do think it has a place in real estate. I think it has a place, especially when people can touch it um, and be part <laughs> of their own revitalization strategy. That's very much in line with so many other things that are happening um, in you know, the world, in the experiment, what we call it experiential economy. You know, the fact that you can go to a winery and crush the grapes yourselves and put your own name on the label, it's the same concept, it's just layered over real estate. Um, we want people to financially invest into something that they can see and touch and say, you know, I'm part of that, um, which is great because we don't have a lot of other movements out there. <laughs> we went through an entire uh, recession without riots like they had in, <laughs> in Europe. And I think it's because we don't have a lot of movements. Um, and then the concept of micro units. Um, 
So units are getting smaller. Um, I had a conversation with somebody the other day, and I believe it's in Noma. The average income in Noma is about $75,000, something like that, um, for a one-person household. Um, but if you look at a 25-year-old person, a 30-year-old person, it's $75,000. I won't comment on their college debt, but they're making specific choices to get to know them. They are often not getting a car, they're not getting cable, and a few other fairly, it seemed benign, fairly um, robust um, dollar amounts. It then allows them to spend 30% of their income, or $2,000, a month on an apartment. Those are choices that people are making. Um, and they're also comfortable with that one bedroom apartment being a lot smaller than they were a long time ago. And they'd rather have that than a roommate's situation. There's another person making $45,000 at 75, I'm sorry, 45 years old at $75,000 and they may be married and have a child. They need a different housing accommodation. Many people choose to buy the car and just keep trying out. Um, instead of moving to a neighborhood that may not have all the amenities today, um, like Woodbridge, which is a great single family home, working class neighborhood, um, that with $75,000 you could probably make it work and you're still in the city. Um, there's schools and all kinds of other factors that go along with that, so I'm not trying to put the blame on it, but I will say that as a developer, we're starting to look at what are the ways in which we can increase flexibility with our units? I think in 2015 we're going to run a little design competition where someone could make a one bedroom today or two one bedrooms or one bedroom and two bedroom, but then with the existing plumbing stack and don't destroy my mortgage for the entire building, convert that into a three bedroom. Because at one point or another we're going to house these families in high rise apartments. And that it goes back to the concept of universal design and making sure that we're you know, practicing that and somehow figuring out how our multifamily housing can be more flexible over time. In the back, and then maybe one more. The um, disparities, you mentioned about health care disparities, and I'm curious about, especially in DC, that there's a profound difference between mortality and morbidity for the DC residents as opposed to the surrounding communities. Could you maybe comment from your urban planning background about how you kind of take that into account, either in your design or even if you wanted to maybe think broadly about DC going forward, how they may take it um, under advisement or think about it going forward? So I'll, I'll put it in very plain speak. I told our client, you've got to make beautiful places. If you think you're going to convince a 45 year old person who's been smoking for 20 years that they need to go to the doctor every year, or a woman who's turned 40 who needs to start checking for all kinds of cancers and do all appropriate tests, you're going to have to make these places beautiful. And not just beautiful from the exterior, every room, all the way from the curb to the, to the lobby to the, to the person at the front desk to the waiting room to the examination room. Because if not, it's going to be very difficult to change behaviors. And those are just architectural moves. There's got to be seamless way that they don't feel um, uh, stigmatized if they have Medicare or other public subsidies. There's got to be a way, but the way we can affect a business would be through the architecture and through the site design and where it is and how it works. Um, and so we very much try to, to, to make that splash so at least that side of the business can work. It goes all the way back to, to when I was working in Silicon Graphics back in California. Your job is not to build the internet your job is to, to help people stay here longer. And so we take that into everything we do. Yeah. Okay, last question. Yes. Um, oh, well, two more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, we mentioned um, the redevelopment, you mentioned the redevelopment of uh, uh, Southeast, the fact that streetcars aren't coming through the Anacostia Corridor. Uh, Joe Lynch Development Partners have interest in Southeast Anacostia. There's so many gymnastics involving historical issues there, but uh, do you have any interests or projects in that part of the city? Well, well let's, just, let's just be um, clear. Southeast is probably 18 neighborhoods. Anacostia doesn't represent everything east of the river. Um, 
Um, and so we have investments in Congress sites. Uh, we, have, we have done projects for our clients in historic Anacostia, <coughs> um, Deanwood, Hillcrest, uh, Bellevue. Uh, so several different neighborhoods. Um, we've either invested and or have developed projects for clients. Um. Couple things, not two two main questions, but born and raised here as well in Upper Northwest, and, and so I've been able to live through the transformations of seeing Seventh and Fourteenth Street burn down and revitalize, and it, it's wonderful to see, and it's wonderful what you guys are up to, and I love the idea of the authenticity trying to maintain that and. I've gotten involved in this 11th Street Bridge project, so I find myself over in Anacostia, and as a kid I went there because the Jewish cemeteries were there. Today I go there for different reasons and, and appreciate just the, the grounds and the role and the views and stuff. So I applaud all that you guys are doing, but I also, and it's great people since, um, you know, the last three mayors have encouraged businesses and, we now have money in the coffer and all those good things. Um, people are moving into this town again. Um, I worry about having just been up at ULI in the middle of Manhattan that maybe we get too many people down the road in this. You know, everybody's. You know, I look at the statistics in 2030 and 2050, and how many people are going to be living in cities. And think of you know some in Asia and some now here and maybe in my hometown. Too many people. Number one and number two. Though you guys are doing a great job in trying to and and achieving affordable housing as part of your component, um, there's still lots of people that even that's one part of what we pay for. 30%, 40%, maybe even 50% of our income, but the cultures are changing in these neighborhoods big time. My own kids are living, you know, in Shaw, and I certainly never thought I'd see that, and, and what have you. So there's still lots of push out in the PG um, and stuff. And so 20 years from now, how do we prevent it becoming too urbanized and we don't have hard to imagine not having green space, but within the neighborhoods, not maintaining the green space or things like that. So a couple of things. <clears throat> uh, one, I think that we are one uh, boutique company. And so by no means are we solving all the ills in the city. I didn't think you suggested that, but it just goes back to the concept of entrepreneurism. Uh, we have to replicate us lots of different fields and verticals to actually make a dent into uh, making this place still have a soul. Um, second, we have to invest in the arts, because the arts is, I think, the number one way in which you can pull people together from all different places, sports as well, which is why I'm supporting the Olympics. Um, but I think between those two things, you can tell stories longer than you can with office buildings and just a, a building. So it's got to be the Activity so I love what's happening at the Atmos Theater, and Sam, Sam did for many years um, uh, up until recently, um, and, and lots of other organizations like that, Studio Theater, etc. Um, uh, second, remember the city, two things. Remember, if you went to Jewish cemeteries, do you remember the schools, and I'll say broadly, east of the river, 50, 60 years ago? And the way I remember it, is I actually went into a school in Congress Heights on Mississippi Avenue, and one of the principals had all the class pictures up <laughs> on the wall. And so, East Washington is a first generation suburb, the rolling hills, no grid, um, and you watch the class pictures from the 40s to the 50s, Brown versus the Board of Education, to the 50s to the 60s. By the 70s, it has completely changed its complexion. Um, and so I always 
remind people that that happened then. There was another change that happened when there was an urbanization that happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s. That these changes happen. They're not always comfortable. People don't like to say it, but it happens a lot. And this city has actually functioned pretty well at a million people. Um, that even the planners' best projections would take us another 50 plus years to get to. Um, and then finally, I think the city which will act differently from five years ago, only 30% of the jobs in the district were held by district residents, to now it's 45% of the jobs in the district are held by district residents. So that means the income tax stays for all the jobs that are here. But it also means that the way the city functions, it will function like a suburban uh, office node. It'll function like a city in which people will walk and bike and do other things because it really isn't that far to go from East Capitol Hill to Capitol Riverfront. You can bike that all day long. Um, it's really not that far to, to um, live downtown Gallery Place and walk to Southwest. It's really not. Um, and so I think if we actually can not only capture folks to live here and, and work here, but then it really shapes the patterns in which we're going to interact and how places are going to function, which I think would be really exciting. And beyond our, our current definitions of what we do. Thank you so much.